Hello and welcome once more to Conscious TV. My name is Ian McNay. And my guest today is Andrew Rawlinson. Hello, Andrew. Hi. And I found out that Andrew, he lives in France now, he's British, but he was coming to, uh, to London because he was doing a talk to promote his new book, which was called The Hit, Into the Rock and Roll Universe and Beyond. And I thought, that's interesting. It's the beyond bit that interested me. And I, I, I researched him a bit and I found out he'd also written a few years ago this book, the book of enlightened masters, Western teachers in Eastern traditions. And I already had this book on my bookshelf. It was a bit dusty, but it was there and I had looked at it a few times over the years. And what we like on Conscious TV is looking at consciousness and who we really are from different angles. And Andrew's book, his new book, is very much about the world of music, but going beyond the world of music. And we've done, we have done some programmes from the music side before. We had Gary Latchman a few years ago, whose stage name was Gary Valentine, who was the original bass player in the band Blondie. We had Jenny Boyd, who wrote a book called It's Not Only Rock and Roll, about the creative inspiration of musicians. And also, more recently, Jar Wobble, the original bass player in Pill, who has an amazing story to tell. So it kind of fitted. Here's Andrew, and we're going to explore what the hit is. Because right. um, the hit to a lot of people, of course, is having a hit record, but to you, it's something different. And I'm going to start, first of all, by saying you sent me some notes, and what I really liked was in your notes, it said, you said you were a minor van at school and rusticated twice from Cambridge, one time for brawling, and the second time for drug smuggling. I thought, that's that kind of guy on Conscious TV. So what happened actually at Cambridge then? Well, I suppose I did have a bit of um, an issue, which was I didn't really like fitting in to structures of any sort. That certainly happened at school, which is why I did some minorly destructive things, anonymously, of course. And then at Cambridge, uh, yeah, I got into a brawl with someone outside a pub and uh, he complained to the college and the college were quite understanding and sent me away for a term. And then I went on a long trip to Morocco and came back with um, a kilo of hash which was discovered by the customs officer. And the college very kindly said, well, you can go away for a year now, but be careful. So I was careful and I came back and I got a degree. Excellent. So we're going to build a programme around this whole theme of the hit. Mm -hmm. So when did, you first, when, when did you have your first significant, significant hit? And, and how did the hit impact you? What form did it take? Well, the way I usually tell this story is when I was 18 years old on a three-month holiday from England to Istanbul. I was with a friend and we went to Mount Olympos, which is a magnificent mountain straight out of the ocean. And we drove up it. There's only a certain distance you can go before you have to go on foot. And uh, we were on foot and suddenly a storm blew up, which is entirely appropriate, of course, for Mount Olympos. And there was a lightning strike, which must have been about 50 meters away, where there was no gap between the sound of the thunder and the flash of the lightning. They were completely simultaneous, and it was extremely powerful. And in that moment, I had a realization, although of course I'm now using later terminology to express it, that I was unlimited, just like that took no time, and I knew it was so. But how did you know you were unlimited? You do, the knowledge and the fact are identical when the hit comes through. And so it isn't a question of how, it's a question of what is it really. And I, it had no connection with anything that I'd done before, although then I can look back at other realizations that I'd had, which weren't nearly so dramatic, because being blessed by the king of the gods is quite dramatic. But there were much smaller uh, blessings or realizations or revelations, they're all the same, they're different terms for the same fact, I think. 
uh, which I'd had from when I was quite young. But I'm not in any special way. I'm not claiming at all that I've done anything different from anybody else. It's just that I can see that, that all hits are the same. This is what I have discovered. And it doesn't matter what the context is. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. It, it's all a flash of light that comes through, and it's always the same light. And for you, what happens is there's this feeling, shall we say, that you're unlimited. It's, well, it's a realisation, and I like the term realisation because it's ambiguous. It means that you, you make something real, as when you realise your dreams, and also you are aware that something is so. And the word has both those meanings. And it is, that's my experience, that these hits occur from all directions at all times. And they, they just go on and on and on. And it's only our wish to categorize them that, try, that makes them appear separate from one another. So, for example, when I was 11 years old and I was at school, I was taught Euclid's proof that there is no greater prime, greatest prime number, which is a very, very simple proof, which an 11-year-old can understand. And I remember quite clearly this, wow, of course, of course. And that, of course, is the same as seeing the sun go down. We've all seen the sun go down and thought, wow, look at that. And I thought, what I'm saying is there's no real difference between seeing the sun go down and getting Euclid's proof. They're the same. And how, did that, how does that affect your life practically, especially when you're young? Well, I was, I guess when I was young, I was looking for the hit. Now, I realise that the hit is coming through all the time and you don't have to go looking for it. But when you're young, you know, you've got a lot of drive and a lot of energy and that's what you do. You go looking. So I went looking and I did the same looking as most young people do. I mean, I did it through ideas and as well as through, you know, music and girls and drugs. You know, sex, drugs and rock and roll. <laughs> I mean, that was what I was into and I wasn't the only one. There were many yeah. millions of us doing it. Yeah. There's another example you mentioned that I really like was when you saw a painting when you were 16 yes. years old. Yeah, so that was when, as the first time I'd left England, went to Paris. The same friend that I was on the Olympos with, actually. And we and went... Who actually is Roger Waters who's from actually, Pink Floyd. Yeah. Yeah. Is, exactly. Yeah. We were, you know, great mates and went through some initiations together. And one of them was certainly going to Paris. It was a wonderful experience for two 16-year-olds. And we went to the Louvre and there was a Cezanne and I'd never seen a real Impressionist painting before. I'd only seen uh, reproductions. And, and Impressionist paintings do not reproduce well because you can't get all the subtleties of the layers of paint. And it was a still life base by Cezanne and there was just one petal where he'd obviously just put his paint in his paint and just gone choo, like that. And it was simultaneously a dab of paint and a petal. And I really loved it. It was just, uh, it, was, it was the same as Zeus, you see, and it was the same as Euclid. It was, oh yes, of course. And I hadn't had any inkling that those, those three possibilities, Euclid, Zeus and Cezanne, existed before they happened. But as soon as they happened, I knew that it was a complete revelation. I mean, those are slightly overwrought term that I'm using, but I would use it. And I'd use it of other things too, the birth of my children and also of my grandchildren. You know, which is uh, nearly everybody who's had children and grandchildren will say, ooh, that is something. And when you first met, first met your wife as well? Yes, absolutely. She was sitting on the bed at uh, her brother's birthday party. He, he's a bit older than her and he and I were friends. And she just leant forward and looked at me and I looked at her, and we've been together ever since, 50 years. And tell the story about the, the blade of grass, which I also like. Oh, yes. Well, <laughs> uh, I can't remember after all this time exactly what happened afterwards, but I did want to see her again. And of course, I'd been to the house before because I'd been visiting her brother. And so I went to visit her, but I hadn't got anything to give her. 
And so as I walked up their garden, I just picked up a blade of grass to give it to her, but she wasn't in. So I left a note saying, Lucy, this blade of grass is for you. And do you know what her reply was? She, sent, she came round to where I was, and I wasn't in, and she just left a note that said, when, please? Yeah. A question mark. You can't beat that. <laughs> it's so wonderful that these simple things that come out of love yes. can have such an impact. Yes, well, that is... It isn't... doesn't need anything huge, no, just... No, that is the, the realisation of all lovers everywhere. Yeah. And, uh, you know, love is complete. And uh, you, when you have that touch of love, you know that you have been given as much as any person can be given. Mm. And it's free. I mean, that's the thing about the hit. It's free. So you've been given as much as any person can be given yeah, in that moment. Absolutely. Yeah. And so it's when it's love and it's Zeus and it's Euclid and it's Cezanne. I mean, you could go on and on. Um, I like the example of uh, Jacob Burma, who had a realization, you know, medieval personage, uh, when he saw light reflected off a plate. And you can't get much more basic than that. But that's how he got it. So, you know, Olympos, you know, the thunder and lightning, light off a plate, they're the same. This is the beauty of it, that it's all the same. There's no, there's no gradations in the hit. There's only gradations in how it's packaged. You see, so much on Conscious TV and maybe I'm partly guilty of this, we're looking for the dramatic mm. insofar as we want somehow to be catapulted out of life mm. as we know it mm. and to find a new reference point, a new way of being to take us down <coughs> to the ground of being who we really are, whatever term you use. And yet what I like about your story, and there's so many examples in this hit book, mm. of just small things that do have the effect of bringing you I was going to say out, but in a way, they're bringing you in. Yes. Well, the hit doesn't distinguish between inside and outside. Yes. It, again, that's a distinction that is brought a, a, along afterwards. And I, th I think those distinctions are fine. There's no, but you, you don't need them at the time of the hit. So the beauty of the hit is that there are dramatic and wonderful transformative experiences that people have and which change their lives on the spot. And there's an absolutely no reason why that shouldn't happen, and there's absolutely no, nothing wrong with them. But they are not better than the little things. Yes. And this reminds me of Plotinus and Neoplatonism. He says, in this realm, which one enters, you know, through mystical exploration, etc., etc., everything is great. The small is great. Mm. Absolutely spot on, mate. <laughs> and then when you were 22, I think it was. You found a master in yes, India. Yes, yes. Tell us about that. Well, there's a bit of a story there. I mean, I had a friend uh, who went to India, having found out the address of the centre in the Punjab. And he went out as quite a wild character. And he came back totally changed. So there was a gang of us in Cambridge, all of whom knew him, and we were very influenced by the change that had come about in him. And by great good fortune, the master himself came to London a, a couple of months after he returned, our friend returned from India. So we all went to see him, a whole load of us, 20 of us probably. And he just had, you know, as soon as I saw him, it was a hit, although I wasn't using that terminology then. And uh, his, just his presence, his kingliness, his total openness. And I thought to myself, I'd taken LSD and had a great few trips, not many, and they were wonderful. And uh, I thought to myself, what this master is offering is a trip for all time, for the whole time that the creation itself has existed. That did appeal to me. So I thought, OK, I'm going to do this. So I got initiated and I did it. And again, in the notes you gave me, you, what really 
appealed to you was the fact he was majestic and how humble he was. At the same time. Yeah. I mean, I have never met anyone who was kingly apart from him. I've never met anyone who was truly humble apart from him, and he was both. Yeah. Uh, and I think the explanation for that is that he regarded himself when he was appointed master by his predecessor as the servant of the Sangat, of the community of devotees. And for him, that was, the tr that was his role. And he was a true servant, although he was also the, the Lord, which is, it's just wonderful to perceive this. You should say his name so people know who we're talking Hazur about. Hazur Charan Singh Ji Maharaj. And he's, he's, he's gone now. Yeah, he, he died in 1990. Yeah. And uh, I will tell you about his death, if I may. He had a bit of a dicky heart. And he'd had some problems with the heart. I mean, he worked non-stop. Huge you know, meetings of a million people. You said at dinner last night that... That's right, a million people, and he would feed everybody. He would charge them no money. Yep. It was superbly organised. Yep. It just it yep. doesn't sound possible, does it? I know, I know. Well, I mean, it, 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 those numbers built up over a long period of time, but they, they could do that. But so he is hugely... Uh, the demands in his time are just with... A, don't stop, don't stop. And he had, uh, I think, a bit of a heart murmur and he had doctors who were, you know, saying, take it easy, take it easy. He said, no, the people have come, and it is my duty to receive them, etc., etc. And there is a video of him giving a satsang uh, two days before he died, and he looks just the same as he ever did. And they, you know, but then when he'd stopped giving the satsang, they'd brush him off and put him in bed and look after him. And everybody else was working hard. And on the 1st of June, the doctor who was in charge of him and the nurses who were in charge of him were so exhausted, they fell asleep. And in that moment, he left the body, mm. completely on his own, surrounded by a million people. He, he died in front of a million people? Well, no, not in front of them, no. but I mean, no. he was... Okay. They were all there for him. Okay. Every single one yeah. was there for him. Mm. And yet, he... He managed to manoeuvre a point when everybody's attention was elsewhere and he was completely on his own and he left, yeah. just like that. And what effect did that have on you? Huge effect. I mean, it still does, you know, I mean, you lose someone like that. It's yeah. powerful. Yeah. And his teaching was predominantly Buddhist? No, no, it wasn't. It was a form of Sikhism, really, because okay. he would refer to the Adi Granth, which was, you know, the collected um, teachings of the first five Sikh gurus and a few other non-Sikhs, including Kabir and such like. And it was about inner light and sound and travelling through inner regions back to the original point of creation with the help of someone who had already made that journey and who initiated you and looked after you all the way. That was the teaching, really. And one was vegetarian and no alcohol or drugs and live a straight life. And if you were the, kept yourself as uncontaminated as possible, then you could detach yourself from the clutches of the world. And how do you feel about that kind of teaching now? I can't go along with it now. Uh, it took, you know, I really felt so disloyal to, to be critical of his teaching because I had no criticism of him at all. He only gave, he was only open-hearted and generous. Um, but I just came to see that the idea that we're somehow in a prison here and we're in a prison, we've been put in prison by the creator of all the regions of the universe. But, but, but why do you say we were put in a prison? Well, because that was the teaching. That as the, the t you start off with a pure original point and by a series of cascades, it gets more and more solidified and more and more material until you reach this physical level, which is the most material of all. And in this material level, we are susceptible to all kinds of 
follies, not to mention, you know, unpleasantnesses and cruelties, for which we have to pay through karma and through reincarnation. Okay. Yeah. And th so this is a prison. You have to get out of this. So we've been sent to jail for a reason that we can't possibly understand. We commit crimes in jail, which make, means that we have, you know, even more time to serve in jail, and we don't even know why. Okay. I found that difficult to swallow. Yeah. So for 20 years, you taught Buddhism? Yes. So how did that start? Well, I did philosophy at Cambridge, and Western philosophy, although I didn't really do much studying, um, but I, that's what the subject that I did, and I got a degree. And then I found out that there was someone at Lancaster University in the northwest of England who had started a religious studies program. And I, I was already initiated by this time. I was initiated in the last year of my degree. So I thought, well, I, c I couldn't think what I could possibly do to earn any money. So I went up to see this man in Lancaster and he said, uh, what do you want to do for your PhD? And I said, well, I've got some vague ideas that zero, one and infinity might all be the same number in disguise. And he said, well, I don't really know what you mean, but why don't you come and do it anyway? Well, I didn't actually do that when I got there. I did a PhD on Buddhism, which uh, turned into an examination of a particular Mahayana Sutra. And so I, st I studied that. And then once I'd got my PhD, I then applied for a job and got it. So I taught. So zero and one and, and infinity. infinity are the same thing. In disguise. Can you explain that? Yes. One, you can never have one on its own because the, in order to say that there is one, you've already got something outside the one to say that it is one. So you, one and mul must turn into multiplicity and there's no end to multiplicity, so it will always tend towards infinity. So if you'll have one, you've got one, you'll have infinity. Which is true, of course, of the, of the numbers. One, two, three, four, go on to infinity. Although that's just an analogy. So one will turn, always turn into infinity, which is, and in the cosmological version of that is the one being in the beginning, whatever that might mean, wishes to know himself and manifests the universe, which, you know, cascades forth without cease or hindrance. So the one becomes infinite. And then zero is not a number. Um, zero is a condition that precedes all numbers. You know, that's why it's exactly in the middle of the positive integers and the negative integers. And that's what, and you can't divide by zero. And zero reduces everything to itself. Even infinity times zero equals uh, zero. It doesn't equal infinity. Infinity times infinity equals infinity, but infinity t times zero equals zero. So zero is, is, is a bit, this is an analogy I like, and uh, is like silence. All silence is the same. All sounds are different. And the reason that all sounds are different is that they have a beginning and an end. Even the sound of the universe itself will come to an end. But silence doesn't come to an end and it doesn't have a beginning and there is no distinction. So sound always takes place within silence. But how do we find true silence? There's always noise wherever we are. This is true, but realisation in the sense of being hit by something, there is a... <laughs> and in that instant, which you can't define and cannot grasp, and cannot reproduce is something that is not of the same order as everything around it, like the centre of a circle. You know, that you have to have the centre in order to have the circumference, in order to have the circle, but the centre itself has no dimension. So, from what you're saying, silence isn't necessarily to do with sound? No, it's the inverse of sound, but you couldn't have sound without silence. Because okay. otherwise you'd have to have a sound that obliterated everything all the time. It's not, it doesn't happen. Yeah. So you, in order that there should be sound, there must be silence that precedes it 
is underneath it, is on both sides of it, is on top of it, is inside it. I mean, whatever pronoun you want to use, that silence were, is always present. So is the hit and silence the same yes, thing? Yes, absolutely. Mm. And that's why all hits are the same, because all silence is the same. Yeah. I remember also you were telling me about when you took heroin one time, obviously many, many years ago, and something happened there, but it was to do... Talk about it, because it yes. was... It was, a, it was to do... Well, I was, I was injecting myself, and in yeah. fact, it was heroin, which I tried a few times, and, you know... And it, but it could have been anything. I, I could have been diabetic, and I could have been injecting myself for that reason. But I didn't really know what I was doing, and I got a, an air bubble in the syringe. So that goes into the bloodstream, it gets pumped round, and then suddenly the heart was pumping nothing. And in that pumping of nothing, it was, I, I was immediately reminded of Zeus and Mount Olympus. It was yeah. the same. So it, it, it wasn't the heroin, it was the nothingness. Yes. And that was, ah, I, I'm, I don't know where I am. I haven't got anywhere to be. And that's freedom. And I didn't have anywhere to be when I realised that I was unlimited. Um, I didn't have anywhere to be when that air bubble went through, my, through the heart. And it also happened, because uh, I did a lot of meditation, and uh, without very much success, but right at the beginning, I did have one time when I was meditating with my wife. Uh, we had, before we had children, we were on a little cottage on the edge of the moors, got up early, and I was concentrating, and suddenly, I don't know whether that's right, perhaps not suddenly, yeah, it was suddenly, I didn't know where I was. I didn't know that I was sitting, I didn't know if I was male, I didn't know how old I was, I didn't know I was in a bedroom in a cottage on the edge of the moors. All of that had gone. Mm -hmm. Now, according to uh, the teaching that I followed, this is concentration. I'm just saying it's the hit and it's the same as the air bubble and it's the same as Zeus and it's the same as Euclid and it's the same as Cezanne and it's the same as holding the one you love in mm -hmm. your arms. It's all the same. And it it's, can be small and it can be big, and it doesn't matter whether it's small or big. It's the, somehow I'm just looking at that, how it relates to me, and it's this, it's the recognition, isn't it? And I wonder where that comes from. It's the recognition, it comes out somehow that something busts the routine, the routine of the thinking mind, the routine of the, of the life, and it just for a, Yes. A second, a split second, there's nothingness, stillness, the hit. Yes. And beauty also. I mean, you know, you can see, I can be it sitting on the top. Blows the mind. Yeah, somehow. I'm on the top of a bus, I look down, and there's a woman walking along. She doesn't even know I exist. Obviously, she's walking on the pavement. Yeah. And it's, that's yeah. what it is. Yeah. So, I, what I f feel at my advanced age is that, you know, being alive is just a, is just a series of that. It's all a series of those things. And on the other side, there's something that appears to be continuity holding everything together. And that doesn't really exist, does it, that continuity? Well, Somehow it, I, it's a con construct. I would, say, I would say that continuity is silence, but of course silence is not something that you can get hold of. You can't make silence. This is the beauty of it. Mm. You could make any sound, that you can imagine, and you can't make silence. All you can do with silence is stop making sound. And when you were 60, mm. which is a few years ago, again, looking at my notes here, something happened, the world started to fall away. Yes. I was sort of... That did surprise me, actually. I didn't, I didn't have any preconceived ideas of what it would be like to get older. But, and of course it helps that, you know, our children have grown up and they've got their own lives, so it's just me and my wife living in a very quiet place in France. But what I noticed was things just started dropping away. And in a sense, it's the inverse of adolescence, of puberty. But I mean, I had, you know, because one is susceptible to great zigzags at that time of life. And I also was, but 
I thought it was great. I had a, uh, you know, I, I made a lot of mistakes and got into trouble quite a lot, but I had a great time as an adolescent. Everything was opening up. It just going wham, 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 like that. I loved that. And now I'm noticing at the age of from 60 onwards, it's all going ch 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 It's the kind of inverse of this. And it's beautifully simple that things just start to fall away and one can drop things. And the beauty of dropping, of course, is that it's a completely unskilled act. You simply open your fingers and let it drop. It doesn't matter what you've got in your hand. It can be absolutely anything. You drop it in exactly the same way and everybody drops whatever they've got in their hands in exactly the same way. And this is a natural process. It's, it's as natural as adolescence if we allow it. Yeah. I mean, when you're an adolescent, there's nothing you can do about it. Those hormones are going to kick in whatever you do. But when you're older, which is dropping away the inverse of that, uh, you can actually fill your life up with a whole load of rhubarb if you so choose. But if you don't choose, it just happens by itself. And it's just delicious. You see, again, the notes that you, you, you sent me beforehand, it says, my life, I realise now, is like the sunlight. It has no weight. It lays itself out. Yes, but it's lighter than air. Yeah, that's exactly And it. you're a big guy. Yes. But your life, yeah, life is lighter absolutely. than air. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it, I see that as a gift. I really do. And I think I, I, and that's, it's a natural gift. Everybody is given this. That you, the, the dropping of things and the non-grasping of things arrives by itself from about 60. But, I mean, of course, it would vary with various people. And then, you know, there are famous historical examples where it happened much younger than that. But I think it's natural about that time. And it's, it's just wonderful. You don't have to do anything. It just arrives by itself. Here you are, boy. Have this. But there's a, isn't there also an allowing for the process to happen or allowing for it to hit? Well, yes, yes, there is. But, I mean, that's just being true to what you encounter, really. Um, you know, you, when you're an adolescent, you should take off in all directions simultaneously. When you're 60-plus, you should, you know, not in any heavy moral sense, just allow things to slough off. And then you become very light. And, you, and there's no sense of loss at all. In quite the opposite. There's a sense that you've been given something very, very precious and you don't have to do anything. You just receive it. A term you used when we were talking last night quite a lot was everything is ungraspable. Yes, yes. Well, that is a Mahayana teaching, or the teaching of Mahayana Buddhism. OK. And there is that wonderful aphorism that nirvana that is grasped is sansara and sansara that is not grasped is nirvana, which sums up Mahayana Buddhism, really. So there, there aren't two things. There isn't, oh dear, we're in sansara, we've got to go to the further shore, which is a terminology that the Buddhists use, in order to attain nirvana. I wish to attain nirvana, I wish to leave this sansara behind. No, it's not, it's, there is only this. And it, if you grasp it, you turn it into sansara. That is to say, something heavy that you have to carry around with you. And if you don't grasp it, you're free. And that's true of everybody at all times in all conditions. Male, female, young, poor, black, white, rich, you know, king and beggar, makes no difference. Do you always feel free now? No, I don't, because I'm all mixed up just like everybody else. I mean, I'm, it's very important to me that I am an ordinary man. And I've had a few experiences in my life which one could say were extraordinary, but I think that happens to quite a lot of people, actually. The extraordinary comes in now and again to everybody's life. Um, I, I'm lucky enough to love the woman I live with, and she loves me, and I love my children, and they love me. I mean, you know, that's all there is. The, you know, I mean, the things that I have attained in my life really are neither here nor there. They're just ways of passing the time. But the... And I'm, I'm caught up, and I fall over, but I don't really care that much. Yeah. I mean, I do care that I cause people some disquiet. 
Um, but I don't really care about the fact that I trip and fall. I mean, so what? I don't see that as any, as a big deal. Anyway, we should talk a little bit about your masterpiece, oh. the book, The Hit. And I might try and open the right couple of pages because this is more than, this is probably the kind of, the most grand book we've had on Conscious TV. I'm just opening it randomly. I'm not even sure what pages come out. But there's, it's, um, Taking you a long time to do. It, it, see, took, uh, it took me longer to write that than it took Edward Gibbon to write Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. <laughs> for, the, for those who know about that work of Gibbon's, which it, that is some comparison. I'm trying to find the pages with pictures. There are lots of pictures here. But yeah. just talk us, t talk us through the theme of the book and how it ties in with what we've been talking about, the hit, because it, is, it does come from a rock and, a rock and roll yeah, start. Yeah, it does. But it goes much more yeah. deeper. Well, I wanted, I wanted to write a book about the hit in all its forms, but I realised that you had to have some thread that would hold it together, because otherwise it would become too bitty. So I chose rock and roll because that is my music. You know, I was born in 43. I was 13 when Heartbreak Hotel came out by Elvis. You know, and most people were at, of, uh, of my age or rem remember that. And, and, it, and it is my music. And one of the things about rock and roll and pop, they overlap and, you know, the distinctions between them can be rather sort of silly to make, but there is a distinction. And the, the way I put it is that pop says, I've got something nice for you. You're really going to like this. And rock and roll says, want to try some of this? <laughs> it doesn't tell you what it is and it yeah. certainly doesn't say you're going to like it. Yeah. And so this led me to link in rock and roll with the hit because the hit is a derangement. It knocks you about. And rock and roll is a knockabout music. It's not soft and easy. It's, uh, I wonder where we're going to end up here, but we're going to go on anyway. But then, so there's a, a, the hit is a derangement, and I divided it up into four obvious categories. Derangement of perception, derangement of the personality, derangement of society, and derangement of reality. You know, they get, these things are getting bigger as we go through. Yes. And I took the first one, which is the, uh, the derangement of um, sensation or perception from Artur Rimbaud, the great poet. It's one of his phrases in one of the letters that he wrote. So I just took that and I just took it beyond to personality and society and reality itself. And I'm saying the hit is always a derangement but it's also always a revelation. But you also say at the start of the derangement of the senses chapter mm. that all derangements are connected. Yeah. Like subatomic particles, they just keep reflecting each other, jumping between each other and turning into each other. Yes. Well, this is just another way of saying all hits are the same. The hit, if it's a, a, a derangement of the senses, of, the, of perception, then, you know, we know that's quite easy. You just have to get drunk on Christmas Day and you know what that is. Uh, and that in itself doesn't lead very far, but it can lead further if it's seen uh, that something comes through with drunkenness, which it does. There is a kind of, of freedom in that. I mean, it, it doesn't appeal to the moralistic and puritanical aspect of, of human beings, but there is actually something that comes through there. And the derangement, the fact that the hit is both a derangement and a revelation is a very nice sort of move that you're not this way and yet you're given something. And because you're given something, you will not you will accept the derangement. You will accept being knocked sideways because of the revelation, because of the gift. And you say, like, you find it's a jungle and as soon as you find a path, you lose it. Yes. I uh, think we all experience that in life. We think we found a path mm. and then we follow it and then at some point we get lost. Yeah, that's right. And being lost, you know, that out of that comes discovery, out of that comes adventure. 
and lots of mistakes and errors, but that's part of discovery, you know. I mean, it's all, you know, Newton and all, the, they all went through that, all the great discoverers went through a process when they didn't, and creators also, you know, they get lost in what they do. And, but that lo being lost is the preliminary to discovery. And so the loss is necessary, and if the loss is necessary, then it isn't really loss. And uh, I remember when I interviewed Jenny Boyd on Conscious TV about her book, It's Not Only Rock and Roll, it was very much, I think she interviewed 75 people, and um, she, she knew many of them, most of them personally, so George Harrison's and your Eric Clapton's, and they all pretty much said the same thing mm. in a different way, mm. that the real genius doesn't come from them, it comes, mm. something is, they didn't use the word deranged, but something is a bit out of order here, and boom, yep. in comes that genius. Right. It's like, the, where does the inspiration come from? Not really here, but it, from here. Exactly, and yeah. this is, you can call this higher order, if you like, but then, you know, the notion of higher order, you can get lost in that, because then you start thinking, well, the lower order, we don't want the lower order anymore, let's get rid of that, and then you get a bifurcation between the lower and the higher, and then, you know, that, that can lead into a, a lot of contortion. But, yes, there's something, the realisation that you are not limited to what you thought you were. Mm. I mean, um, Milan Kundera said somewhere in one of his writings, a man who looks into the mirror and realises that he is not who he thought he was can never go back to who he thought he was. Once mm. you've had that realisation, you can't go back. Uh, and not going back is breaking through to something else. And everybody knows what this is. Everybody knows what the hit is. There are no exceptions to this. Everybody knows. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be exotic and extraordinary. Everybody knows. And that realisation is, oh yes, that's it. Everybody knows it. When you said that's it, I felt that. Well, that's because you know the hit. That's it. Yeah, that's it. So derangement of the personality yes. is your second section yes. of the book. To be a, a hit, well, then, then you talk about it. Well, the, ob the obvious example, especially in the context of rock and roll, is people going off the rails. A, a, you know, a kind of madness. You know, I went to school with Sid Barrett. Good old Sid, yeah. what a great guy he was. And he went off the rails for whatever explanation might, might, one might want to give about that. Um, so, you know, he paid a price. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people think the price was too great. I, I, you know, again, this is a matter of debate. So I think we're all subject to derangement of the personality. I particularly like a line from Othello, when Othello describes himself as one who loved not wisely, but too well. Good boy, Othello. He's the boy one for me. One who loved not wisely, wisely but, but too, too well. well. In other words, you know... To I would say totally. Well, yeah, and, you know, he ends up killing the woman he loves because yeah. he's been fooled by a complete shit. But that's part of the drama and so forth and so forth. But this is derangement of the personality. And yeah. he is a true tragic hero because he was a noble man who loved a woman and got lost in his, the distortion of his own love. And this is the risk that we all take. And it's the, it is the risk of being alive that one can get lost. And again, you say in the introduction to that second chapter, everybody's looking for who they are, but they are nobody. Yes. And that's, of course, the great gift to realise that you're nobody. Yeah. Because then you carry no weight. <laughs> and as soon as you think you're someone, you've got to keep that polished, man. <laughs> there was another, just to, just if I can find this other, you gave me so many good quotes. I could keep you here for hours, if I'll find it quickly. Um, um, 
There is no reality without identity, and identity is a show. Yes. Why? There is no reality. That's a deep thing. There is no reality without identity. Mm. And identity is just a show. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's a kind of a condensation of, of a lot of teachings, actually. Yeah. And I, there's a parallel to that, which uh, I also like, is there's no time without memory, and memory distorts time. Mm. So you've got to have it, you see, in order to have the, the, the access to the past or even the future, you've got to ha use a, a, an attribute that actually distorts what you're trying to access. And this is inescapable. You know, there, I'm not um, persuaded by teachings that say that there are some people who have no distortion at all. I mean, even Ramana Maharshi, who, in my view, of all the people of the 20th century, or the great, he was the, well, the greatest, the most purely realized. Uh, he, it was notorious that how he used to tell people off for wasting potato peel. And if he saw a single mustard seed on the floor that had been dropped while people were preparing food, he would scold people for having dropped it. Now, I'm sure you know that a mustard seed is quite a difficult thing to see, apart from anything else, it's so small. So, you know, of course, this is a very, very, very minor thing, but that was part of his personality. Apparently, he also used to slightly joke about it. He knew that he was a bit pedantic about the old, you know, don't waste anything, not even a single mustard seed. And then chapter three, derangement of society, the hit is both a grace and a disturbance. Yes. Well, you know, society is a very convoluted thing, as we know, but we, you can't have human beings except they exist in society. The very few definite uh, instances of children who have been brought up away from human beings, they uh, cannot learn to be human unless you catch them. If you catch them after about the age of eight, they can't learn to be human. Mm -hmm. So you, we can't, ha I can't, no one can have an identity apart from the society of which they are part, whether that's 300 people living in the middle of the Amazon or, you know, the largest society on earth. It's everybody is part of at least one culture and probably several and probably all competing in various ways. And there is huge derangement in all of that. And yet it is necessary so we're getting a common uh, set of theme here is that we need to be human, to be alive. Things like personality and time and memory and culture, which are inherently distorting. You can't operate except away from them. You just can't. So we have to accept that those things which appear to be distorting are actually also revelatory, that the things which appear to get in the way are also necessary means of receiving mm. the hit, yes. the revelation, yes. the grace. You can't get rid of them over here so that we can got a nice little package over on this side, which is all right. That is a fantasy. So where does that leave Advaita? Well, Advaita is... Uh, it's a beautiful teaching, but it has its limitations because all teachings have their limitations. You know, it's not that, there are, again, there is no teaching which has no limitation, although all teachings like to think that they don't have any limitation. And its limitation is that it has to go into huge contortions to explain the appearance of separation that everybody knows you know, intimately, because we all know what separation is. It has to keep saying, ah, oh, it's not real separation. It's only illusory separation. It has great difficulty in um, being able to get over the truth that everything is one. If you read any Advaita, I mean, from Shankara right up to the people who are teaching it right now, they all have that difficulty. It's because non-dual teachings always, always have that difficulty. They all have to say, it's not really like that. And in fact, my favourite Advaita teacher was Yogi Berra, who was a baseball player for the New York Jets, I think, 
who was known to be a bit of um, an oddball, he once went to pick up a pizza and the girl said, shall I ch cut it into four slices or eight? He said, better make, better make it four. I don't think I could eat eight. <laughs> and he once said, nothing is as it appears and everything is exactly as it is. In my view, this is the best metaph metaphor metaphysical teaching I've ever come across in my life. Say that again. Nothing is as it appears, yes. and everything is exactly as it is. Mm. In, and in this teaching, it just goes woof, like this. You know, you start, you start off with nothing is it appears, and it suddenly turns back on itself to everything is exactly as it is. So yeah. which is it? Is it? It's not what it appears, it's exactly as it is, and there is no middle ground between these two. There's this constant movement, this constant swaying to and fro, which is being alive, inside which you have, you know, light falling on a metal plate which enlightens um, a man in 1623 or whenever it was, and you have uh, Euclid and Cezanne and Zeus and the list goes on forever. And the fourth chapter is derangement of reality. Mm. And I like the little bit you wrote underneath that in the book. All, words, all worlds are a show. Reality is open, it is constantly transforming itself, it goes beyond itself, it is where illusion begins. Yes. Where illusion begins. It has to, where else can it come from? Mm. It must come from reality itself. Mm. So you can't dri drive a wedge between the two, which is nirvana that is grasped is sansara and sansara that is not grasped is nirvana. You haven't got uh, reality over here and illusion over here, let's get rid of illusion and keep reality, it can't be done. So it, the, the, there is, you know, there was, a, there was a Zen teacher who said, now that I am enlightened I'm just as miserable as I was before. <laughs> Great, good for you. Someone had to say it. <laughs> we got about three or four minutes left. What's your favourite story from this wonderful masterpiece, The Hit? My favourite story from it? Well, it has to be an Elvis story because I'm... Elvis, absolutely. I'm a big Elvis fan and he is so extraordinary and what has been made of him is uh, so extraordinary. So I'll tell you this just little story which I'm very fond of. You know, he lived at night for the last 25 years of his life, really. And um, he had this big entourage around him. And one of the men who in this entourage, his wife, was expecting a baby in the local hospital in Memphis. So four in the morning, Elvis says, let's go and visit her. So off he goes, you know, and there's 12 people behind him and he's dressed as Elvis dresses. And as they're going along the corridor to the, the room where... He, uh, the woman who's expecting the baby is there. He, um, there's a woman being, another woman who's obviously about to give birth be, on a, you know, a, a bed being pushed along. She's going, oh, oh, oh. And he says, stop. He puts his hands on her belly and says, it'll be all right. <laughs> now, it just so happens that this woman is in the bed next to the wife of the man in his entourage. And the woman who's on, on whose belly he places her ha hands says to the wife, do you know what? I had an amazing dream last night. I dreamt that Elvis came to me and said everything would be all right. <laughs> and that's really a true that's story. That's a true story. And, yeah. you know, this is just wonderful because... Um, the, the dream and the re and reality, which we think we can make a distinction between, in her case, she couldn't. All right, you know, she was on the point of giving birth and a woman on the point of being birth is already in an elevated state. But uh, that was the way she related it, you know, in all innocence as being as truthful and as straightforward as she could. I had a dream that Elvis came and said yeah. everything will be all right. You have a whole section at the end of the book on the disruptors. Mm. When Elvis, of course, is one of the disruptors, yes, yes. isn't he? And there's a lot of rock and roll people that were disruptors. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Well, that's just part of the notion of, dis of yeah. uh, derangement, really. Yes. And so I have all kinds of people in there, including, you know, very well-known people like JFK and then Marilyn Monroe, because yeah. you have to link those two. And you weren't very complimentary about her, I felt. Well, no, I mean, I think she can look after herself. I mean, hell's bells. I mean, she, you know, someone said, 
if all you had to do, do to be another Marilyn Monroe is be a blonde and a bit fluffy, we'd have had one by now, but we haven't. Yeah. Because there was, you know, there was something else. And, um, you know, once you get into JFK, then, of course, you've got to do Jackie. You've got to do Jackie O and Aristotle and Assis, and whose previous go girlfriend was Maria Callas. And the whole thing, really, all the fireworks just to start going off because Maria Callas was in a, a, in a class of her own as well. You also have... I don't know if I'm going to find one quickly. You have, you have some great kind of family trees. Yes. I found one quickly here. I'm not sure if I've come up with the camera or not, where you put together all the most unlikely characters somehow. Yes, and, exactly. And, that, yeah, that's and this leader of the pack. What a one... Yeah, that's yeah. a wonderful story in itself, yeah. yes. Yeah. So we need to finish the... In the, in the world of finite time, we're there. So, Andrew, I'm going to hold up your book once more, the full title, The Hit, Into the Rock and Roll Universe and Beyond. And it's as much rock and roll as beyond, which it should be. Thank you very much for coming to Conscious TV and giving your wisdom. It's been a very different programme, which I've appreciated. Well, thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Good. And thank you, everyone, for watching Conscious TV. And uh, I hope we see you all again soon. Goodbye.